Hi viewers, welcome back. I am Madhu. One more time with you to share some important questions from various nursing officer exams of different universities like AIMS, BHU, Minhans, BSSB, PGIMS, Rotak, VMMC, RML, LHMC, SSKH, KSCH, and Military Nursing Services. So, basically, this video is all about the important questions for nursing officer exams 2019. Hope you guys like the video and do not forget to subscribe our channel sat 2 knu 2.0 online nursing channel. For more updates, press the bell icon. So, here we go with the video and the question first is, which of the following substances ask the client to ingest for treating hypoglycemia? And the options are 2 to 5 gram of simple carbohydrates, option B, 10 to 15 gram of simple carbohydrates, option C, 18 to 20 gram of simple carbohydrates, and option D, 25 to 30 gram of simple carbohydrates. Again, you guys have a 10 seconds. Choose the most suitable option among the four. Please read the question carefully. Do not get distracted by the distractors among four options. Only one is the right answer and you have to choose that most suitable option. And the right option is option B, that is 10 to 15 gram of simple carbohydrates. How? To reverse hypoglycemia, the American Diabetes Association recommends ingesting of 10 to 15 gram of simple carbohydrates such as 3 to 5 pieces of chocolates. So it's a standard quantity to take 10 to 15 gram of simple carbohydrates. Now moving to the next question. In an education program for a female client with diabetes, what a nurse educator suggests regarding the frequency of performing the exercise to meet the client's goals. And the options are do exercise at least once in a week, do exercise at least five days in a week, do at least three times a week, or do it every day twice. I read the question again. In an education program for a female client with diabetes, what a nurse educator suggests regarding the frequency of performing the exercise to meet the client's goal. Again, please read the options carefully. Do exercise at least once in a week, at least five days in a week, or at three times in a week, or do it every day or twice a day. And the right answer is do at least three times a week. How? Diabetic clients must exercise at least three times a week to meet the goals of a planned exercise such as lowering the blood glucose level and maintaining weight, increasing serum HDL and decreasing serum triglyceride levels. To attain all these levels, a diabetic client must exercise at least three times a week. Now, the next question, which among the following would be expected by a nurse lead to a client with hypothyroidism to report as his health concern? I read the question again, which among the following would be expected by a nurse lead to a client with hypothyroidism to report as his health concern? And the following options are, Increased appetite and weight loss, puffiness of the face and hands, nervousness and tremors, thyroid gland swelling. Do read the questions carefully and options too. Understand the question and please focus on what portion is more important or what is the topic the examiner asking you. And the right answer is... Option B, puffiness of the face and hands because hypothyroidism clients must have a puffiness on their face and hands. And the rationale is hypothyroidism that is also known as mixedema causes facial puffiness, extremity edema and a weight gain. 
sign and symptoms of hyperthyroidism that is graves disease we call it as a graves disease also includes an increased appetite weight loss nervousness tremors and and last thyroid gland so the next question is nurse washa assessing a client who undergone unilateral adrenalectomy recently which of these is characteristic symptom of hyperthyroidism so here the options are muscle weakness tremors diaphoresis and constipation i'm reading the question again nurse washa assessing a client who undergone unilateral adrenalectomy recently which of these is a characteristic symptom of hyperkalemia that is increase in calcium levels so the options are muscle weakness tremors diaphoresis and constipation and the right answer is muscle weakness muscle weakness bradycardia nausea diarrhea and paresthesia of hands feet tongue and face are findings associated with hyperkalemia it occurs as a result of hyperaldosteronism the next question is oral anti diabetic agents are effective only if client has option a prefers to take insulin orally option b type 2 diabetes and option c type 1 diabetes option d pregnancy with type type 2 diabetes read the question again understand the question what topic is asking what the thing is asking by the examiner oral anti diabetic agents are effective only if the client has prefers to take insulin orally type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes pregnancy with type 2 diabetes and the right answer is option b that is type 2 diabetes and how oral anti diabetic agents are only effective in adults client with type 2 diabetes oral anti diabetic agents are not effective in type 1 diabetes pregnant and lactating mothers won't be prescribed with oral anti diabetic agents because it affect in uncertain so the next question is what is the first intervention for a client experiencing myocardial infarction that the easy one and the options are option a morphine administration option b oxygen administration option c obtain in an ecg and option d administer sublingual nitroglycerin reading the question again what is the first intervention for a client experiencing myocardial infarction or abbreviated as a mi and the options are morphine administration oxygen administration obtaining an ecg and administer sublingual nitroglycerin and the right answer is oxygen administration because this is the first priority for a nurse to intervene oxygen administering supplemental oxygen to the client is the first priority of care the myocardium is deprived of oxygen during an infarction so oxygen administration must be the first priority in cases of mi the next question is in which type of cardiomyopathy sucker involvement occurs option a congestive option b dilated option c restrictive and option d hypertrophic reading the question again in which type of cardiomyopathy sucker involvement occurs option a congestive option b dilated option c restrictive and option d hypertrophic and the right answer is option d hypertrophic in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy hypertrophy of ventricular septum not the ventricular chambers is apparent 
This type of abnormalities is not seen in other types of cardiomyopathies. Question number 8. Which of the following cardiac conditions does a fourth heart sound that is S4 indicates? Option A. Dilated aorta. Option B. Normally functioning heart. Option C. Decreased myocardial contractility. And option D. Failure of ventricle to eject all the blood during systole. Do read the question carefully again and again till that you don't understand the question. The thing is asking is important to understand. Which of the following cardiac conditions does a fourth heart sound that is S4 indicates? Dilated aorta, normally functioning of heart, decreased myocardial contractility, failure of ventricle to eject all of the blood during systole. And the right answer is option D, that is failure of the ventricle to eject all of the blood during systole. And that makes the fourth heart sound, that is S4. And S4 occurs as a result of increased resistance to ventricular filling after atrial contraction. The increased resistance is related to decreased compliance of a ventricle. Question 9. Which of the following condition is associated with a predictable level of pain that occurs as a result of physical and emotional stress? Option A. Anxiety. Option B. Stable angina. Option C. Unstable angina. And Option D. Radiant angina. So, you guys have 10 seconds. Please read the question carefully. Which of the following conditions is associated with with a predictable level of pain that occurs as a result of physical or emotional stress. So the options are like option A, anxiety, option B, stable angina, option C, unstable angina, and option D is radiant angina. And the right answer is option B, that is stable angina. How? The pain of stable angina is predictable. In nature, builds gradually and reaches maximum intensity. Unstable angina doesn't always need a trigger, is more intense and lasts longer than a stable angina. Variant angina usually occurs at rest, not a result of exercise or any other stress. The predominant cause of angina is increased reload, decreased Afterload, coronary artery spasms, or inadequate oxygen supply to the myocardium. Again, a caution from the predominant cause of angina is increased preload, decreased afterload, coronary artery spasms, or inadequate oxygen supply to the myocardium. And the right answer is option D, that is inadequate oxygen supply to the myocardium. And the rationale is like inadequate oxygen supply to the myocardium is responsible for the pain accompanying angina. Increased preload would be responsible for the right sided heart failure. And the next question is in neurosyphilis, CSF analysis will show. Increased gamma globin, decreased gamma globin, increased albumin, and decreased albumin. Please do read the question carefully. Again, I'm reading the question. In neurosyphilis, CSF that is cerebral spinal fluid analysis will show increased gamma globin, decreased gamma globin, increased albumin, and decreased albumin. And the right answer is option A, that is increased gamma globin. And the question was like increased gamma globin indicating a demyelinating disease such as multiple sclerosis, neurosyphilis, and a gullet bar syndrome that is also known as a GBS disease. Next question would be like McIntosh should never be folded because it becomes rough. 
tearing occurs, difficult to store or chance of wet surface. Now that's the easy one. You all should know this. Why Macintosh should not be folded? Option A becomes rough. Option B it can tear off. And option C difficult to store. And the last one is a chance of wet surface. And the right answer is option D a chance of wet surface. Rubber Macintosh should be stored in dry, dark, or cool place. It should not be exposed to sunlight. They should be folded by rolling them to avoid breakage. So never fold your Macintosh, always roll up. And the next question was, key complex and the sleep spindles are seen in NERM sleep stage 1, NERM sleep stage 2, NERM sleep stage 3 or NERM sleep stage 4 and the NERM stands for non-random eye movement. So read the question again and first understand the questions carefully. K complex and sleep spindles are seen in stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 or stage 4. So, the right answer is option B, that is NERM sleep stage 2. Sleep spindles are sudden burst of auxiliary brain activity generated in the reticular nucleus of thalamus that occurs during stage 2 of light sleep. And like sleep spindles, K complexes are defining brain waves of stage 2 sleep. They differ from sleep spindles in their form. Unlike the rapid burst of activity represented by the sleep spindles, K complexes are large waves that react to external stimuli while sleep. Next question is the most common problem associated with tube feeding is hyperglycemia, infection, diarrhea, or vomiting. That's two easy question and you guys all should know this the most common problem associated with tube feedings because tube feeding is a very common procedure among the clinical sites and the options are hyperglycemia infection diarrhea and vomiting and the right answer is option c that is diarrhea among gastrointestinal complications like diarrhea nausea vomiting bloating and abdominal distension. Next question is immunization gives us which type of immunity? That's a too easy question. Passive, artificial passive, active or initial. I'm reading the question again. Please understand the question and remind us. Immunization gives us which type of immunity? Option A. Passive immunity, option B, artificial passive immunity, and option C, active immunity, or the last one, option D, that is natural immunity. And the right answer is option C, that is active immunity. Active immunity, or the antibodies that develop in a person's own immune system after the body is exposed to an antigen through a disease or when you get an immunization, that is a flu shot. Yeah, immunization is also known as a flu shot because in immunization or in the vaccination, a person is a little bit exposed to that particular antigen. Next question is, a patient who is a sense taken black mode tube suddenly experiences difficulty in breathing, which type of following action should the nurse take first? Very important questions. And the option A is administer oxygen with a nasal cannula. Option B, elevate the head of the bed. And option C, listen to the client's lungs. Option D, cut and remove the tube. So I'm reading the question again. Please do understand the question carefully and read patiently. The question is like, a patient who is since taken black mold tube suddenly experiences difficulty in breathing. 
Which of the following action should the nurse take first? First, you have to write the priority of your care or your actions. And the options are option A, administer oxygen with nasal cannula. Option B, elevate the head of the bed. Option C, listen to the client's blows. And option D, cut and remove the tube. And the right answer is option D, that is cut and remove the tube. Next question is, which of the following is the medication of choice for a patient with an open contaminated injury and no recent history of tetanus immunization? That's a two easy question. Option A, tetanus immunoglobulin. Option B, tetanus antidoxin. Option C, DPT vaccine. And option D, tetanus toxoid. And the right answer is option D, that is tetanus toxoid. Question 18. Which among the following is an indication of portal hypertension? Uh, that's an important question again and a very interesting topic. And the options are like option A, hematemesis, option B, confusion, option C, asterixis, option D, and elevated dystolic blood pressure. Reading the question again, one more time for you people. Which among the following is an indication of portal hypertension? And the options are like hematemesis, option B, confusion, option C, asterixis, option D, that is elevated diastolic blood pressure. And the right answer is hematemesis, that is blood in vomiting. And the next question is respiratory drive in COPD patient is option, option A, oxygen, option B, carbon dioxide, option C, partial pressure of oxygen, and option D, that is pH of the blood. What is the important respiratory drive in COPD patients? Option A, oxygen, option B, carbon dioxide, option C, partial pressure of oxygen, and option D, that is pH of the blood. And the right answer is option B, that is carbon dioxide. Moving to the next question, which drug is not given by a subcutaneous route? Option A, insulin. Option B, dibiclin. Option C, erythropoietin. And option D, LNWH, that is low molecular weight heparin. That is the easy question I have ever seen. And you people must know this that which drug is not given by a subcutaneous view and the right answer is option B that is tubercular. Moving to the further, when developing a teaching plan for a client who is 8 weeks pregnant, what foods would the nurse suggest to meet the client's need for increased folic acid? And the options are spinach, Option B, bananas. Option C, seafood. And option D, that is pure gold. Oh, that's a very interesting question. When developing a teaching plan for a client who is eight weeks pregnant, what food would the nurse suggest to make the client's need for increased folic acid needs of the body? And the options are like spinach, bananas, seafood, and a yogurt. And the right answer is spinach. Moving to the next question, what is compression ventilation ratio in adult patient when there is two rescuers? That's a very applied question and this kind of questions you must get in every exam. So, the option A is 30 is to 2, option B 15 is to 2, option C 30 is to 1, and option D, 15 is to 1. Again, reading the question, what is the compression ventilation ratio in adult patient when there are two rescuers? And the right answer is option A, that is 30 is to 2. That is 30 are the compressions and 2 is the bridge. After every 30 compressions, you must give at least a 2 bridge to that patient. 
universal compression to ventilation ratio for adult is 30 is to 2 and for children and infant is 15 is to 2 and the for the newborn is 3 is to 1 that is the three compressions and one ventilations moving to the next question nurse is about to insert a rails tube for a patient rails tube is the same the feeding tube before this act she must be aware of the distance between incisor teeth and a gastroesophageal junction. Which of the following is the correct distance? Option A, 30 cm. Option B, 50 cm. Option C, 40 cm. Option D, 60 cm. That, well, that, that is a very basic question. Nurse is about to insert a wild stew for a patient. But before this act, she must be aware of the distance between the incision teeth and a gastrofacial junction that will be first. Which of the following is the correct distance? And the right option is option C that is 40 centimeters. More. In adults, the distance from the incision teeth to the esophageal gastric junction have been described to be in the ranges of 32 to 50 cm by various studies. Again, this is not a standardized distance, but among this, 40 is the right answer among the provided options. Moving to the next question, well, identify the device in this image. That is option A, force generating uh, Elizabeth device. Option C is cast saw, and option D is headgear. And the right answer is option C, that is a cast saw. Up. Next question is like, what is true about the relationship of epilepsy and scissors? Option A, all people who have scissors always been epilepsy option b there is no relationship and option c all people with epilepsy have a scissors and option d scissors and epilepsy both are the same thing please read the question carefully the options are like all people have a scissors always have epilepsy there is no relationship and all people with epilepsy have seizures and option D is seizures and epilepsy both are the same thing and the most suitable or the right answer is option C that is all people with epilepsy have seizures. Now the next question is the following is the early indicator of shock after surgery. Option A urine is less than 30 ml per hour, option B, tachycardia, option C, urine output 60 ml per hour, or option D, bradycardia. Well, that's also a very too easy and I do apply question and I'm reading the question again. The following is the early indicator of shock after the surgery. Option A, urine about less than 30 ml per hour, option B, tachycardia, Option C, urine output 16 ml per hour and option D, bradycardia. And the right answer is the option D. Option D, that is tachycardia. Moving to the next question. Which one of the following lung volumes and capacities cannot be measured using a spirometer? Option A, tidal volume. Option B, functional residual capacity, option C, vital capacity, and option D, respiratory reserve volume. Spirometer is a device that used in patients having a respiratory problems. And the options are like option A, tidal volume, option B, functional residual capacity, option C, vital capacity, and option D, respiratory reserve volume. And the right answer is functional residual capacity. You cannot measure the functional residual capacity using a spirometer. Common measurements obtained by a spirometry include 
the vital capacity or the forced vital capacity FVC. We abbreviated this forced vital capacity as FVC. The maximum amount of air that can be expelled from the lungs after a full inhalation. Forced expiratory volume in one second. Volume of air which can be forcibly exhaled in one second. Tidal volume. What is tidal volume? Means the volume of the air inhaled and exhaled during restful breathing. The inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes, that is IRV and ERV, the volume of additional air that can be forcibly inhaled or exhaled outside of the normal tidal breath. Next is the spirometry cannot, however, be used to measure the residual volume. The volume of the air present in the lungs after forced expiration or any capacities which incorporate the residual volume such as a functional residual capacity and a total lung capacity. Volumes and capacities include the RV are estimated using alternative techniques such as a wall body, plethosmography and helium dilution. And the next question is, which information would be included in the teaching plan about pregnancy related breast changes for a preemie gravidar client? I'm reading the question again one more time. Which information would be included in the teaching plan about pregnancy related breast changes for a preemie gravidar client? Growth of the milk duct is greatest during first eight week of gestations. Option B. Enlargement of the breast indicates adequate levels of progesterone. Option C. Colostrum is usually secreted by about the week of gestation. And option D. Darkening of the areola occurs during the last month of the pregnancy. Well, that's interesting question from the OPG section. Which information would be included in the teaching plan about pregnancy related breast changes for a pregnant gravidar client? That is a mother uh, expecting mother for the very first time that is the pre gravida and the options are like growth of the milk duct is greatest during first eight week of gestation enlargement of the breast indicates adequate levels of progesterone clostrum is usually secreted by about the week of the gestation and option b is the darkening of areola occurs during last month of the pregnancy and the right answer is option C, that is, clostrum is usually secreted by about the week of the gestation. Moving to the next question, but before we must read the rationale of about the uh, about question 28, clostrum is usually secreted by about 16th week of gestation in preparation for the breast feeding. So, the question 29 contains which among the following adverse effects? Listed here is not related to oral contraceptives. Option A with gain, option B nausea, option C headache, and option D that is ovarian cancer. Now, reading the question again one more time very carefully and patiently, which among the following adverse effects listed here is not related to oral contraceptives? So, the option A is with gain, well, that is very common. Option B, that is nausea. Option C, headache. Option D is ovarian cancer. And the right answer is option B, that is ovarian cancer. Some such studies suggest that ovarian cancer and endometrial cancers are reduced in women using oral contraceptives. Question 30. When performing a Leopold's maneuvers, which action would the nurse ask the client to perform to ensure optimal comfort and accuracy? Option A. Breathe deeply for one minute. Option B. Amputate her bladder. Option C. Lie on her left side. And option D. Drink a full glass of water. Well, that's a very interesting question again. When performing the Leopold's maneuvers, which action would the nurse ask the client to perform to ensure optimal comfort and accuracy? Option A, breath deeply for one minute. Option B, amputate her bladder. 
option C lie on her left side and option D drink a full glass of water. And the right answer is option B that is empty her bladder first. So the rationale to this question is Leopold maneuvers involve abdominal palpation. The client should empty the bladder before the nurse palpates the abdomen. Doing so increases the client's comfort and makes palpation more accurate. But this releases the external pressure or the extra pressure that is put in by the bladder. Question 31. A DNC is scheduled for a previous gravida client admitted to the hospital at 10 weeks gestation with abdominal cramping, bright red vaginal spotting, and the passage of some of the products of conception. On assessing the client, the nurse will find which of the following psychological feelings option A, ambivalence, option B, anxiety, option C, fear, and option D, that is guilt. Please do read the question carefully, a very common question and you people must see this kind of cases if you are doing clinicals and the options are like option A ambivalence, option B is anxiety, option C is fear and option D is the guilt and the right answer is option D that is a guilt. With a spontaneous abortion, many clients and their partners feel an acute sense of loss. Their grieving is commonly includes feelings of guilt, which may be expressed as wondering whether the women could have done something to prevent the loss, anger, sadness, or a disappointment. And the next question is, Nurse Nanda is assessing a client after a thyroidectomy. The assessment reveals Muscle shrinking and tingling along with numbness is in the fingers, toes and mouth areas. The nerve should suspect for which complication. That's a very interesting question. And the options of these questions are option A, tetany, option B, hemorrhage, option C, thyroid storm and the option D, laryngeal nerve damage. And the right answer is option A that is tetany. Tetany may result if the parathyroid glands are excised or damaged during thyroid surgery. The next question is which of these signs is an indicative sign of increased intracranial pressure that is ICP. Option A, intermittent tachycardia. Option B, polydipsia. Option C, tachypnea. Option D is increased restlessness. Please to read the question carefully, which of these signs is an indicative sign of increased intracranial pressure? Option A is intermittent tachycardia, option B is polydipsia, option C is tachypnea and option D is increased restlessness. And the right answer is option D that is increased restlessness. Restlessness indicates a lack of oxygen to the brain stem, which impairs reticular activity system. And the next question is the best position given for the client who had undergone gastrectomy is option A, left side line, option B, low collars, option C, supine position, and option D, that is the prone position. So. Again, a very applied portion in the clinicals. The best position given for a client who had undergone gastrectomy is option A, left side line, option B, low fowlers, option C, supine, and the option A is the prone position. And the right answer is option B, that is the low fowlers. A client who had undergone abdominal surgery is best placed in low fowler's position. This relaxes abdominal muscles and provides maximum respiratory and cardiovascular function. Moving to the next question, the ability of the client to metabolize the TPN solution adequately. Which of the following signs the nurse would monitor? 
option A, hyperglycemia, option B, hypoglycemia, option C, hypertension, option D, elevate blood urea nitrogen concentration. Please again read the question very carefully. It is a very important question from an exam point of view. The ability of a client to metabolize the TPN, that is the total parenteral equation, TPN solution adequately. Which of the following signs the nurse would monitor? Option A, hyperglycemia. Option B, hypoglycemia. Option C, hypertension. And option D, elevate blood urea nitrogen concentration. And the right answer is option A, that is hyperglycemia. During total parenteral nutrition administration, the client should be monitored regularly for hyperglycemia as the nutrition is directly going or directly administered to the veins or to the blood. Next question is a female client has an acute pancreatitis. Which of the following signs symptoms the nurse would expect to see? Option A, constipation. Option B, hypertension. Option C, ascites. Option D is jaundice. Please do read the question carefully and understand the options. And the right answer is option D, that is jaundice. Jaundice may be present in acute pancreatitis owing to obstruction of the biliary duct. And the next question is what a nurse should offer when a client has been diagnosed with glomerulonephritis and she complains of thirst. Option A, juice. Option B, milkshake. Option C, ginger tea. And option D, a hard candy. So, a very interesting question. Please read the question carefully and don't get distracted by the distractors among the four options. Only one is the right answer. What a nurse should offer a client has been diagnosed with glomerulonephritis and she complains of a thirst. Option A, juice. Option B, milkshake. Option C, ginger tea. And option B, that is a hard candy. And the right answer is the hard candy. Hard candy will relieve taste and increase carbohydrates but does not supply extra fluid to the body. The next question is most serious complication of acute renal failure is option A constipation, option B anemia, option C infection, option D is platelet dysfunction. Among the four you have to choose the most suitable answer and the right answer is option C that is infection. Infection is responsible for one third of the traumatic or surgically induced death of client with renal failure as well as medical induced acute renal failure. The next question is a client is admitted with newly diagnosed Hodgkin's disease. Which of the following would the nurse expect the client to report? Option A, lymph node pain. Option B, nitrates. Option C, weight gains. And option B is headache. Okay. I'm reading the question again. A client is admitted with a newly diagnosed Hodgkin's disease or the Hodgkin's lymphoma. Which of the following would the nurse expect the client to report? Option A, lymph node pain. Option B, nitrates. Option C, weight gain. Option D is headache. And the right answer is option B, that is nitrates. Assessment of client with Hodgkin's disease or Hodgkin's lymphoma most often reveals enlarged painless lymph node, fever, malaise, and a night sweat. That, that all symptoms are also known as B symptoms. And the next question is, all are essential requirement of nursing care of a child with severe diarrhea except option A, administration of fluid orally or parenterally, option B, taking weight daily, option C, replacing lost calories, option D, maintaining normal body temperature. Please read the question again. 
and understand the portion. What portion is asking for? All the essential requirements of nursing care of a child with severe diarrhea except option A. Administration of fluid orally and parenterally. Option B. Taking weight daily. Option C. Replacing lost calories. And option A. Maintaining normal body temperatures. And the right answer is maintaining normal body temperature. Next question is which group of drugs mimics parasympathetic activity? Option A. Anticholinergic agents. Option B. Cholinergic agents. Option C. Adrenergic agents. Option D. Anti adrenergic agents. So that is a very easy question. Which group of drugs mimics parasympathetic activity? Option A, anticholinergics, cholinergic agents, adrenergic agents, or the anti-adrenergic agents. And the right answer is option B, that is cholinergic agents. Cholinergic drugs mimic the parasympathetic nervous system. Anticholinergic agents antagonize the parasympathetic nervous system, and adrenergic agents stimulate the sympathetic system. The next question is, Amphetamines are included in the category of drugs of abuse because of their ability to option A causes nervousness, option B decreases weight, option C raise blood pressure, and option D enhance performance. Again, read the question. Amphetamines are included in the category of drugs of abuse because of their ability to option A causes nervousness. Option B, amphetamines cause decrease in weight. And option C, amphetamine raise blood pressure. Option D, that is, amphetamine enhances the performance. And the right answer is option D, that is, amphetamines enhances the performance. Drugs that produce desired effects, such as feeling of euphoria, a feeling of good. And improved performance tend to be overused and abused. Amphetamines are considered as a drug of abuse because they enhance the performance and produce a euphoric effect. And the next question is when caring for a client who is receiving penitoin or a warfarin, that is also known as comedine, the nurse would expect which of the following drug or a drug interaction. Option A. Decreased effectiveness of warfarin. Option B. Increased effectiveness of phantom. Option C. Increased effectiveness of warfarin. And option D. Decreased effectiveness of ferritin. So that's a very cheeky question. But you have to answer the right option among the four. And the right answer is option A. That is decreased effectiveness of warfarin. Decreased effectiveness of warfarin, the interaction will reduce the effectiveness of warfarin. And the next question is, which of the following assessment is most essential before beginning a drug regimen of an anti-muscaranic agent? And the options are, option A, history of diabetes, option B, ethnic background, option C, date of birth, and option D, activity intolerance. Please read the question carefully. Which of the following assessment is most suitable or essential before beginning a drug regimen of an anti muscaranic agent? Option A, history of diabetes. Option B, ethnic background. Option C, date of birth. And option D, activity intolerance. And the right answer is option C, that is a date of birth. Anti-muscarinic agents are contraindicated in old age. The next question is, when administering anti-anxiety medications to an early client, which of the following action by a nurse is essential? It is about the anti-anxiety medications and the options are like option A, monitor vital signs, option B, suggest to reduce doses, option C, taper dose before stopping, and option D, implement a fall prevention protocol. And the right answer is option D, that is implement a fall prevention protocol. And why so? 
increased sedation, dizziness, and hypertension are side effects that place the elderly at high risk for the falls. So the nurse must take the precautions. Next question is when preparing to discharge an eight month old infant who is recovering from gastroenteritis and a dehydration, the nurse teaches the parent about their infant dietary and fluid requirements. The nurse should include which other topic in the teaching session? Option A, nursery schools. Option B, pallet training. Option C, safety guidelines. Option D, preparation for surgery. Understand the question. Please read the question carefully and understand the question. Do not get distracted by the distractors. Read the options carefully. Option A, nursery schools. Option B, toilet training. Option C, safety guidelines. And option D, preparation for surgery. And the right answer is option C, that is safety guidelines. The nurse always should be reinforced safety guidelines when teaching the parents how to care for their child. By giving anticipatory guidance, the nurse can help prevent many accidental injuries. And the next question is, nurse Rina should begin screening for lead poisoning, blood poisoning when a child reaches which age? Option A, 6 months, option B, 12 months or a year, option C, 18 months, option D, is 24 months. So, reading the question again one more time, nurse Rina should begin screening for a lead poisoning when a child reaches which age? 6 months, 12 months, 18 months and 24 months. And the right answer is option C that is the 18 months. The nurse should start screening a child for lead poisoning at age 18 months and perform repeat screening at age 24, 30 and 36 months. High risk infants such as premature infants and formula fed infants not receiving iron supplementation should be screened for iron deficiency anemia at 6 months. And the next question is, Ravinder, a healthy adolescent has meningitis and is receiving IV and oral fluids. The nurse should monitor this client's fluid intake because fluid overload may cause cerebral edema, option B, dehydration, option C, heart failure, and option D is hypovolemic shock. Very interesting question one more time. Please read the question again and understand. Ravinder, a healthy adolescent has meningitis and is receiving IV and oral fluids. The nurse should monitor this client fluid intake because fluid overload may cause option A cerebral edema, option B dehydration, option C heart failure and option D is hypovolemic shock. And the right answer is option A that is cerebral edema. Because of the inflammation of meninges, the client is vulnerable to developing cerebral edema and increased ICP. And the next question is Dharmendra, age 15 months, is recovering from surgery to remove Wilms tumor. Which findings best indicates that the trial is free from pain? Option A, decreased appetite. Option B, decreased heart rate. Option C, decreased urine output. And option D, increased interest in play. And the right answer among four is option D, that is increased interest in play. Play. One of the most valuable clues to pain is a behavior change. A client who is free from pain is like to play more. And the next question is Nurse Varsha is teaching a mother who plans to discontinue breastfeeding after five months. The nurse should advise her to include which foods in her infant's diet. Option A iron rich formula and baby foods. Option B Paul milk and baby food. Option C, a stem milk and baby food. Option D is iron rich formula only. A very interesting, a very easy question. I'm reading the options one more time. Option A is iron rich formula and baby food. Option D is Paul milk and baby food. Option C is skim milk and baby food. Option D is iron rich formula only. 
and the right answer is option B that is iron rich formula only. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that iron that infants at age 5 months receiving iron rich formula and that they shouldn't receive solid food even baby food until the age of 6 months. The academy doesn't recommend whole milk until age 12 months and a skimmed milk until the until after age 2 years. Hope you guys like the video and thanks for the watching. Please do subscribe our channel sat 2 ku 2.0 online nursing channel and press the bell icon for more updates. Thank you.